Although our next subject is transport, this is not a new road sign. It's a simplified diagram of a new mode of transport, and it may well be the shape of things to come. Things are changing rapidly in the world of modern transport. A brilliant new invention like Concorde can solve one set of problems and create a whole host of new ones. In spite of being a superb piece of aeronautical engineering and a fine example of Anglo-French cooperation, Concorde's future is still in doubt because many people are still not convinced that the benefits of supersonic flight outweigh the disadvantages such as sonic booms. A less publicized but equally valid objection is that increased speed in the air is quite pointless if delays on the ground are thereby increased. Bigger, faster planes mean new or enlarged airports, and the planners are finding it increasingly difficult to get the land they need. Here at Roissy, northeast of Paris, the French are building a third airport to serve the capital along with Orly and Le Bourget. Huge new terminals are being built to cope with the passengers who will be brought in ever-increasing numbers by planes such as Concorde and the jumbo jets. But once they've been cleared through customs, the passengers will still be faced with a 13-mile trip into Paris along motorways which may or may not be congested. The danger is that on flights within Europe, for example, passengers may end up spending less time in the air than they do on the ground, getting from airport to city centre. One solution to the problem is, of course, the railway, which in most cases is still the best method of moving large numbers of people rapidly into and out of large cities. But in many countries, the railways are aging, and although measures such as electrification have brought greater speed and efficiency, most people believe that the limitations imposed by the present track and signalling systems will make it difficult for conventional trains to meet all the demands of the 1980s. There's still hope, therefore, for a new approach, and the French believe that they've found one. This is what the French call an aerotrain, more prosaically known as a tracked air cushion vehicle. It's difficult to say whether it's a train without wheels or a plane without wings. French engineers have been working on the aerotrain project for nearly six years now. The first attempts were made at Gomets near Paris in December 1965 with an experimental half-scale vehicle. Powered by gas turbine aero engines, the early models reached speeds of well over 200 miles per hour and travelled thousands of miles on the test track without encountering any basic mechanical or engineering obstacles. In later models, a shrouded propeller was added for greater speed and reduced noise. Noise has, in fact, been a problem throughout the whole of the development period, and a great deal of research has gone into ways of cutting it down to acceptable levels so that the turbines, which are comparatively cheap and easy to run, can be retained as a means of propulsion.
The current test vehicle carrying 80 passengers is powered by two turbine engines driving a single shrouded propeller. The vehicle sits astride a concrete track in the form of an inverted T. Braking is assured by wooden pads which grip the upright section of the track. Just like a hovercraft, the aerotrain glides along on a cushion of air, in this case less than an inch thick. Since air jets are also directed along the upright section of the track, the vehicle is never in contact with the track. When powered by turbines, the aerotrain is designed to operate at speeds of up to 250 miles per hour on long-distance intercity trips. At this speed, it would be a serious competitor to France's domestic air services. There's also another version powered by linear induction motor which would operate as a suburban service at around 125 miles per hour. This system has already been chosen to provide rapid transit between Paris and some of its western suburbs and will probably be used to link Orly Airport with the new one at Rassi. In the early days of the aerotrain, the main difficulty was in persuading the administrators of the 1960s that this was indeed the transport system of the 1980s. Fortunately, French officials were impressed enough by the vehicle's performance to back the project with several million francs of government money. Now, however, 60% of the shares of the aerotrain company have been bought by an American firm, which aims to invest three million dollars in it over the next five years. Meanwhile, on the other side of the English Channel, British engineers have been working on a similar project, also based on the principle of the air cushion. The hovercraft is, of course, a British invention that was developed rapidly throughout the 1960s. Today, the hovercraft has become one of the fastest and most convenient ways of getting across the Channel and the hovercraft ferries are now giant vehicles that can take up to 200 passengers and their cars. Many of the technicians who worked on the hovercraft's development over the last 10 years are now turning their minds to another application of the same principle, the British hover train. Unlike the French system, Britain's hover train will probably run on a central box-shaped track. The British claim this track is more economical to make and maintain and that it's also stronger, allowing longer unsupported spans across rivers or similar obstacles. Two research vehicles are planned, each 75 feet long and weighing 10 tons. The train will pick up power from magnetic shoes on the side of the track. The seating will be similar to the French model. The 
British government has put over three million pounds of the taxpayers' money into the far too early to say whether they'll get a good return on this investment, or indeed how much more money will be needed before developments can be The train will be powered by an electromagnetic linear motor. Instead of generating a circular motion, as an ordinary electric motor does, organizes its energy into a straight line using the actual track as a coil. This means the motor itself has no moving parts. Although, it can theoretically achieve speeds of up to 300 miles per hour, <laughs> Mr. Charity, this project started in 1967. You've spent four years on it and the best part of three and a half million pounds. And it's only just now that you're really getting around to testing something. Why has it taken so long? Well, because there were a great many things to bring together. There was a, a motor to propel the thing, there were suspension systems to, to lift it, and a vehicle shell and total facility in order to be able to test it properly and to arrive at the optimum system in the end. You've had a number of designs in getting up to this stage, haven't you? We've revised the system uh, on the average about every two years and uh, we've always followed a policy of trying to uh, arrive at the best economic system rather than to stick grimly to the thing we originally thought of uh, ten years ago. But in France, uh, they've, they've had a, a hover train on test, I think, since 1969. What advantages has this train of yours got over the French one? Well, the facility has the advantage that we can test and optimise any system and arrive at the best economic thing in terms of the fare that people will pay in the end, whereas the French system have, has most capably demonstrated that the thing can be done but it hasn't demonstrated that a low fare can be obtained. But would you say that uh, we are ahead of the French or behind the French in development of a hover train? In terms of demonstration, they're ahead. In terms of capability, uh, I think we have a unique facility. What do you think this train... And so Britain and France, partners in the Concorde, are direct competitors in the field of hover trains. For the side that wins, there will be rich rewards. In Japan and the northeast seaboard of America, urban concentration is reaching crisis point, and urgent solutions are needed to the growing problems of intercity transport. The aeroplane can no longer provide an effective answer. The hover train probably can. The Americans themselves are now developing their own designs, using some of the enormous reserves of skill and facilities built up during the space effort. So the French and the British will have to pull out all the stops if they're to maintain the lead they've built up.